Hello, welcome everybody. I'm Joe from United Way's Boss STEM, joined here today by Emily from Autodesk, as well as Kellyanne, who's been facilitating the past week for everybody. Thank you all for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, Emily is actually uh, an alum of BPS, and she's going to talk about uh, her career path at Autodesk, as well as, you know, some advice for you students and working through projects. So take it away, Emily. Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Emily Basagadon. I am the industry outcomes lead for building design at Autodesk. So what that means is that I am able to take all of my experience from working in the architecture industry and bring it to this amazing technology company. And so they'll have a better understanding of how to help architects make better buildings. And uh, let's see. Um, I did grow up in Boston, Massachusetts, and I am a proud alumna of the Boston Latin School. So um, go Boston Public. <laughs> let's see. When I was in high school, I think some of my favorite things to study were German art and also, um, let's see, history was okay. <laughs> And I, I, I generally liked school and liked studying things and all sorts of different things. And if you're the kind of student who loves, um, you know, broad ideas and broad topics, architecture, engineering, and construction are really cool industries for you to look at later in life as potential career paths because they allow you to do all sorts of different things. You can do art, you can do math, you can do science, you can do engineering. Um, all of these different specialties actually all come together to help us make the built environment that we live in. So uh, it's pretty cool. And the, the path that took me to where I am today is I started out as an art major in college and when I got there, I started taking a couple of other courses. Um, one of them was a computer rendering class. And when I started doing a lot of these renderings, I thought they were really beautiful. They were just as beautiful as the paintings I was making. And um, I kept exploring what I could do with digital media um, to match the quality of the work I could do actually handcrafted and painted. And that led me to pursuing a degree in interiors. And then while I was working at a, a healthcare interiors firm, I saw all these architects making really cool decisions about columns and building structures. And I thought, I wanna be like them, that they, they're able to make these really cool buildings and make these really big decisions that I wanna be able to make. So um, from there, I went on to study architecture and I have a master's in that as well as real estate development. So um, I worked in the industry again as an architectural designer doing things like retail design, um, hospitals, big towers, multifamily developments, um, things like condos. And after that, um, I actually was so, so good with technology at that point. Within the architecture firm, I was recruited into the IT part of the company. And um, I don't know if anyone has heard of Autodesk, but they're this amazing company that provides all sorts of software for the architecture industry. And they have this really cool conference every year where if you are into technology and um, architecture, you get to go out to Las Vegas and you can apply to present at this conference. So that's what I did. And um, while I was there, I did a lot of networking with people and discovered that there could be some really cool opportunities for me working at Autodesk where I'm taking my architectural knowledge and combining it with some emerging technology called computational and generative design and so my next step was into the technology world that way. So it's been an interesting career path going from art to interiors, to architecture, to technology. And now actually what I do at Autodesk is mostly strategy. So it's, um, I've gone like a full spectrum through nearly any career you could have. <laughs> and Who knows where I'll go next. So hopefully that's a good summary. Thank you so much, Emily. And that's that's a great message that you don't necessarily have to start off in the STEM world, but you might just find yourself there. And 
especially how, you know, there, there's a lot of aspects of art um, that can actually, especially in the fields of architecture, engineering, construction, are super important for being successful in those fields. So, so that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm curious now about, you know, your current role. I know you're talking about strategy, but, you know, what does your typical day look like and what are the aspects of the work that you enjoy the most right now? Yeah, so um, as the industry outcomes lead, I'm in this really cool, unique position to define the outcomes for executives and architects at firms so that they will want to adopt technology and be able to understand um, how they can really unlock the potential of our technology to make these really incredible, sustainable, um, you know, nicely structured buildings. So as, um, and this is like a, it's kind of a new thing to look at um, outcomes. It's a, it's a big thing in our technology world and in sales worlds in general. Um, so my typical day looks like waking up at 7 a.m. because a lot of the people I work with are in London. <laughs> so uh, they're actually five hours ahead of me. So by the time um, they're eating lunch, I'm getting up. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's pretty interesting because when I was a kid, uh, there wasn't so much like work with people around the globe but as time has passed and you know now I'm an adult a lot of people are working remotely they're working globally they have teams that are spread out all over the world so you could work with someone in London you could work with someone in Asia Pacific regions um, that it's so at the beginning of the day I start with the London people <laughs> we we catch up on what's going on in the architecture industry we talk about architecture industry strategy and and how that should inform certain outcomes for key executives like attracting and retaining top talent for their firms and what that means for what workflows they should adopt in our products. Um, I, I talk with people all over the organization. I talk with marketing, I talk with the product teams, I talk with, um, God, really everybody. And we're all trying to make sure that we're all like aware of the trends in the industry and, and what it will mean for our software to help our customers. Um, so there's a lot of meetings, 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 meetings. And then another thing <laughs> that happens throughout my day is I help to manage a database. And one thing I would like to say to students is um, you can do, you know, art, architecture, engineering, technology. But the one really common theme between all of those things is data. And the, the future of a lot of professions are going to have to do with being able to manage data, being able to visualize data, being able to build things from data. So um, my advice would be, you know, if you're an artist, get comfortable with um, the idea of a database and for that database to help sell your paintings. Or if you're an engineer, think about getting comfortable with databases to help um, engineer your buildings properly and you know it's just in any profession you're always going to have to be dealing with data and databases so um, that's one part of my day and then um, at the end of the day I'm catching up with people in San Francisco because that's where our company's headquarters are so it's like this weird long global all-day marathon <laughs> of meetings and databases <laughs> Um, Emily, just for the students, could you give us an example of how an architect might use data as part of their design process? Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So um, it's actually a, a slide I've been working on in PowerPoint to talk to executives at different architecture companies. When you're an architect, um, you get a thing called a design brief from your client. And the design brief is basically like a Word document that tells you how to make the building that they want. Um, what's really interesting about these design briefs is you can start to pull out really key data points. And what I mean by a key data point is your client might say, okay, we need, um, I don't know, a 10,000 square foot floor plan. We need a two bedroom living unit in this part of the floor plan. We need two exits over here. So as you get these little pieces of data and these little requirements, you can start to build out a plan of 
designing so that it meets the data requirements. And you can set up like a database in the background that says, okay, here's what I actually have in my design as I'm designing and here's the requirements, am I on target or not? Um, this is a new concept uh, that we're working through as a company to get out to our customers saying, you need to start understanding how to do this new thing. It's called parenthetical analysis. It's knowing how your building's performing as you're building it and not after the fact. Um, so that's how data, one way that data is incredibly useful in a design process. Can you, ex can you share with us any kind of out there sort of ways that you might use data? Like I'm thinking even some generative design examples of kind of um, diff unconventional ways of using data to make a building? Yeah. Um, it's funny that you say unconventional because I'm like, oh, Kellyanne, they're conventional now. What are you talking about? But um, <laughs> not for everybody. So, so we have um, different ways of designing, right? When when we were all as a society, uh, probably I don't know, back in the Stone Age, we were doing drawings on walls to convey our ideas. Um, the people at Stonehenge were piling rocks together to make their big ideas in actual model form and when paper came on the scene people were like hey i don't have to move huge rocks around in a field i can actually just put my ideas on this paper and then share it with my friends so um we have all these different ways of making ideas we have the, the ways in the real world with real materials we have these concepts on paper and then as the computers come along we're also able to have big ideas but now they're digital instead of manual and the next step in like having ideas for buildings, we use a process called building information modeling. And what that process does is it combines both like the drawing aspect of having ideas and the model aspect of having ideas. So when you combine these two things, you get what's called BIM. <clears throat> and the real power of BIM is that when you're modeling in a BIM model environment, you're actually able to capture a lot of data in each piece of element. So uh, I'll try to explain this with this little glass here. Um, if I were to model this little glass in a program called Revit in a building information modeling system, this glass, the model, the 3D glass in the world, um, it looks like a glass, right? It's a cylinder, it's got form, it's got liquid in it. But what's cool about a building information model is if I click on the glass, all of a sudden, I can get a little spreadsheet that pops out and says it's got this much water, it's got this much volume of water, um, the water costs this much, the ice costs that much, it's going to cost this much for Coca-Cola to produce the water that goes into this glass for the next seven months, and here's the link to Coca-Cola's supply chain. So it's like a lot of information to store, but you actually store it all inside this little glass, and then you can manipulate that information and use it for all sorts of other things. Um, what generative design does that's super cool is um, if you're wanting to be able to understand what is the best glass to possibly hold my liquid, um, there's a couple of different ways to try to understand that, right? You can understand it through the amount of material the glass is made of. So in the manufacturing industry, what people are doing right now is they're saying, hey, how can we actually make this glass as light as humanly possible, but still functionally hold the water it's supposed to hold? And we actually have an entire product that's just designed around doing that, uh, which is really neat. And that's how the manufacturing world is dealing with this problem. Um, in the architecture world, actually, we're like, you know what, like we could design this glass in about 20,000 different ways. Um, if we wanna optimize this glass, we actually have to understand like who's this glass for and how would they want to optimize? So Kellyanne, if you want this glass to be your perfect glass, we would read through your design brief, understand your design requirements, and then we would build what are called algorithms. Um, I don't know if this is like a big concept for seventh grade, but an algorithm is basically like a recipe, a recipe to build something. Um, if, if anyone's ever baked a muffin, the recipe that you use to bake the muffin that's basically an algorithm. You're, you're assembling all of your little ingredients and then you have a little process for mixing them all together that results in the muffin, right? So we can write algorithms that will result in this glass. And we can write really cool algorithms that result in thousands of different glasses. Um, when we do that, and then we know what Kellyanne's requirements are, 
we can hone in on exactly the right glass for Kellyanne. And this is like a really cool way that data helps drive the world. Now, as someone with like a background in the arts and someone who's like a very creative person, do you feel like it takes away from any of your creativity or your inspiration to have to collaborate with algorithms to make something? Um, no, I honestly wouldn't say that it takes away from my creativity. So um, what's, what's kind of cool is like once we've made the perfect glass, right, it still takes an awful lot of effort to visualize the beautiful glass. So in Revit, I might get kind of a chunky, blocky shape of a glass, but if I want this to be like the most epically, unbelievably beautiful glass the world's ever seen, and I want it to stand next to the Mona Lisa, it's probably gonna take me like two days in a rendering program to achieve that. Um, and there are some people whose whole job is just making a beautiful glass. And it's not just about the glass, it's about the environment the glass is in, the atmosphere around the glass, you know, like the, the special wonderful things about the glass. And I think um, because I have an art degree, I have a very strong opinion on, you know, what does it mean for glass to be beautiful? <laughs> and some people would just um, say like, Let, let's leave it in Revit and call it a day, but no, 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 I think we need to take it to the 16th degree of beauty and have 14 design reviews and put the glass on the wall and think about the glass. So, um, there's room for art, there's room for creativity, and there's room for beauty still when we introduce algorithms into what we're doing. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, that, that was <laughs> awesome. Learn, learned a lot there. Um, and so along those lines, we've been throwing around a lot of different technologies, um, you know, that people in the AEC uh, field are using right now. Can you talk a little bit more about like, you know, I'm a seventh grade student or maybe I'm just starting to think about what I want to do. What are the things I should be paying attention to in class? What are the sorts of extracurriculars I should be looking for? You know, what are the things I should be looking on my own online to sort of get a little bit more exposure to, you know, what folks in the field are actually using and doing? Yeah, I'd say there's like two things and they're like radically different. So um, the first thing I would tell a seventh grader to focus on is like, find like your inner drive to know things on your own. Don't wait for someone to tell you how to do something, like get out there and like figure out the thing that you need to figure out to do and don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything get in your way. Don't let anyone tell you no. Um, if someone tells you no, you're asking the wrong person and go ask somebody else. <laughs> so be an unstoppable force when it comes to learning what you need to learn to do what you need to do, right? Um, a great example of this is there's this product called Dynamo that maybe seven years was like not a huge deal and I don't think a lot of people really knew about it but um, I got this sense that it was like a really powerful thing because it would like automate all the stuff that would take hours and hours and hours to do manually while I was making buildings. So nobody at the time was really like teaching Dynamo and nobody was really using it in the company that I was at. But because I had like a hunch that this could be a really important thing, I just went way out of my way. I went to all the forums, I read all the stuff, I joined the meetups, I hung out with the cool Dynamo kids. And I think like that's, that's what you have to do. Like listen to your own mind and heart sometimes because you can have a sense of something that's really important that could change the world and, and get out there and learn it and do it. And, um, there are things out there that like, for example, are just, I don't think anyone's teaching Dynamo in school unless you're at a college level, but you can definitely use Dynamo when you're in seventh grade, even just to do your math homework. It's, it's a really powerful little like application. So I would say like just relentlessly pursue things. The other thing is like sports, sports and teamwork, super important because you need to collaborate and you need to work with like large groups of people in a major company and to be able to communicate and like work effectively, a lot of what you learn on like a soccer team or like a basketball team, like those lessons will carry over into a work environment. Awesome. So we're we're running uh, we're running up against time here. So I do have we probably have time for a couple more questions. But you know the students over the course of the next you know couple of weeks are working on a project around you know developing solutions for either environmental justice uh, in their community or on uh, Thompson Island. Uh, and so just wondering how, you know, the technologies that you use, that you've been exposed to, 
how are those impacting um, you know, our, our effect on the planet? And how are sort of these technologies being used to help provide you know, more sustainable environmental solutions for what we're facing um, today? Sure. So um, Autodesk has this statement to do more better with less. And we, you know, we want to design for a sustainable future. We're up against a lot of major climate related issues. Being from Boston, one of the things that's always at the top of my mind is sea level rise. And I think I heard the word island in your project title, which immediately makes me think, oh, I hope you're not gonna build close to the edge of that island. <laughs> so um, I would consider like, if you're thinking about um, anything coastal, how sea level rise is going to impact you, how you can design for resiliency, because we have a higher frequency of 100 year storms that generally occur now. Um, our products, we have a very specific product called Insight, and Insight is a tool that helps you analyze um, the energy performance of a building, which is really cool to see that, and you only have to do a very simple early stage like massing model, like something as simple as this glass made of glass, you could run this through Insight and it will give you the performance if it were a building, right? So. Um, it's kind of a cool tool. There's that. Um, there's another really amazing tool that was just released uh, called an EC3 calculator that actually will calculate the embodied carbon of a building, which is like really fascinating for architects and they're starting to adopt this right now. Um, there's a variety of different performance aspects of a building, right? Your MEP or mechanical electrical plumbing systems are going to function in a certain way and perform in a certain way and you can try to understand that. Um, your structural systems will use a certain amount of material and you can try to reduce that. On your construction site, there might be a certain amount of waste that happens there and you can try to reduce that. So there's like a lot of different facets to making a sustainable design, whether you're thinking about how your building impacts the environment um, or how the environment impacts your building or how your building performs. So it's, it's a big problem. Um, there's a famous guy in the architecture industry called Phil Bernstein, and I, I really like uh, talking with him, and he has a great book out there. And he, he refers to these kinds of problems in architecture as wicked problems, because they really are these like wild, unruly, and difficult to, to tame topics. <laughs> so I would say that um, what you're looking at is actually a pretty high level problem, even in the architecture industry. So good luck to you. <laughs> yeah, it's great. We have uh, such bright minds working on this project, our future architects, engineers, and construction workers. You know, it's, uh, it's up to us to start it, but we're gonna eventually have to hand it off to you all. So. You know, thanks to all the students who, who are working through this and helping us think about the future of our planet. So my last question for you uh, is just around sort of advice for these students. You're going to have students who are maybe already super interested in getting into a career in STEM, others who are not at all interested in getting into a career in STEM but might want to work for a company like Autodesk. So I'm just wondering um, if you have any advice for those students, if that advice is different for either set of students and if there's anything you can help them to, to think through their future. I think um, like the one broad thing to say to either of those categories of students is you'd be like really surprised at the very wide array of people that work in a technology company, right? Um, you'd expect it to be, you know, a bunch of programmers, right? But that's only a very, very small part of the company, actually. We have, we have some programmers, we have some managers, we have some executives, we have some people who work in a build space and they hang out with robots all day and they make robots do cool things. Um, we have amazing people who work with education facilities. We have human resources people. We have marketers who just make beautiful, you know, images to show to our customers all day about how cool our products are. There's opportunity for artists. There's opportunity for engineers. There's opportunity for people, people like me, right? So, um, if you feel like maybe you're not as strong in STEM topics, but like you want to be a part of the STEM world, certainly there's space for you there's definitely space amazing well thank you so much emily for your time today this has been enlightening and, and very helpful uh, to the students i hope you had uh you found some value in this and some more ideas for your project as you're as you're building out your solutions um so thank you so much emily it was a pleasure having you on today and uh, if any of the students have any more questions we'll be sure to throw them your way awesome thanks so much have a great day everyone
Thank you, Emily. Take care. Yep. Yeah, bye-bye.